Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Broken Breakfast Seminar on the FCA 2023-24 Business Plan and what it means for you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Goldwyn. I'm a partner in the Financial Services Division at Picare Fiddle John, specialising and heading up our offering to the insurance intermediary market. We've got a great panel of speakers today, and kicking us off will be Richard Wilshire. Richard's a director in our financial services division, specializing in governance, risk and assurance, and effectively all matters internal audit. Richard's presentation is going to be divided into three sections. He's going to be starting off with an overview of the 23-24 business plan, looking at the main focus areas, looking at the FCA's intended outcomes, and also looking at the main challenges facing the FCA in implementing these outcomes. Secondly, and with the implementation date fast approaching, it's no surprise that consumer duty features very heavily in the business plan. And Richard will do a recap of what consumer, me consumer duty means and how PKF can help you overcome any issues you might have on consumer duty. And thirdly, it wouldn't be an FCA business plan without the evergreen subject of financial resilience a topic that's been very close to the FCA's heart over the last few years, particularly since COVID. And Richard's going to take you through the main aspects of financial resilience, which were really introduced by the FCA in last year's business plan, and in particular show you how financial resilience is now going to be embedded in the firm's regulatory reporting regime going forward. For the second half of our presentation, I have great pleasure in introducing Michael Corsioni. Michael is a senior consultant in our New York practice of PKF O'Connor Davis, but has been working cl very closely these days with our IT assurance and auditing practice here at PKF Little John. Michael will be concentrating more on the operational resilience aspects of the FCA's business plan, particularly looking at his own area of expertise, which is that of cybersecurity. Among other things, Michael will be sharing the results of the FCA's recent survey of how insurance firms have been applying the FCA's operational resilience rules and guidance and the lessons to be learned therefrom. I hope you find our seminar interesting. We'll have time for a Q&A session at the end of the formal presentations, but do feel free to interject, interject if you have a burning question that can't wait in the meantime, or if you're concerned that you're gonna forget. And our speakers will be around at the end for a coffee if you want to speak to them on a one-to-one -one basis. So without any further ado, I will hand you over to Richard. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, as Paul's mentioned, my name is Richard Wilshire. I'm a director in PKF's GRC practice, uh, and I'm gonna be taking you through a number of slides today on the FCA's business plan. So as Paul mentioned, the FCA business plan builds on its five-year strategy and builds on the plan that was presented last year. Um, if you haven't already had a chance to read it, I would recommend going to do so either via the PDF document available on the website or on the website itself. So these be uh, easy read to get through this year, but really sets out the tone for what the FCA are going to focus on. Um, I've taken some time to go through and analyse the business plan highlighting today the, the focus areas. Firstly, reducing and preventing serious harm in the financial services market. Uh, what does that mean for the broker sector? Well, it's really, really focusing around that consumer uh, environment, looking at retail insurance broking consumers and preventing, protecting insurers from fraud, mistreatment um, and harm that authorised firms can cause if, uh, if they don't act in their best interest. Setting and testing higher standards. Again, the FCA have made a commitment here in terms of what they're going to do to put customers' uh, needs first, really led here by the consumer duty activity that they commenced last year, resulting in the guidance provided to firms, uh, the implementation programme that they're working on and what they're looking to see firms implement and embed within operations through 2023 and beyond. Um, and enabling customers really to help themselves with firms providing them with relevant, timely, effective information to be able to make good financial investment decisions and good insurance purchasing decisions. Uh, 
The FCA have also touched on here, but not in a great deal of detail, the environmental, social and governance priorities that they're looking to set out and how they're going to help firms meet these um, ESG priorities through 2023. Um, you're likely to see a greater impetus on ESG, probably from some of your carriers, markets that you engage with, and even potentially some of the uh, some of your clients and larger stakeholders that, that you service. Um, but definitely one to keep on the radar. Uh, and I would imagine to see it coming through more into 2024, 2025, that, that sort of period. Um, FCA are also uh, committed to minimising the impact of operational disruptions. Um, operational resilience, again, has been relatively high on the agenda for a number of years. And Michael's going to speak to operational resilience a little bit later on in this presentation. And then thirdly, the focus area for this year is promoting competition and positive change. Um, the FCA wants to be seen as a force for good. Uh, they want to help firms prepare for the future and strengthen the uh, UK's position in the global markets to provide um, high quality, recognised and high standardised uh, financial services on a global platform. So the FCA have done their best through this plan to identify four critical challenges for, for not just the insurance market, but also the, the, F, uh, the FS financial services and a wider uh, as a wider marketplace. But predominantly, this boils down into volatile interest rates and inflation. So what have we seen? Well, we've seen in the last sort of six months, uh, the Bank of England undertake an unprecedented amount of inflation rate raises. Uh, so interest rate rises trying to combat the increased and high uh, perennially high at the moment, it seems, in a level of inflation in the UK. Uh, and we expect that to continue in the near term with perhaps May uh, interest rate rise coming through perhaps next week. Uh, and we expect to see the Bank of England to continue to operate under that mandate to try and ease the um, increasing level of inflation in the UK. Uh, what does this mean for brokers? Well, it, it, it means that potentially um, hurdle rates, bank covenants or return on investments for PE or investors uh, may start to tick up as they're looking to gain uh, more bang for their buck and get a bit more return on their investments from you. Um, might, however, see a slight, slight return on some of your uh, invested income which so if you're in a cash rich position and are able to invest you might see an uptick in the levels of return that you get from investment financing but equally uh, uh, private equity is probably going to expect a bit more return out of you it may also mean that uh, when you're considering if you're in the process of undertaking m a or m a is in your future plans uh, you may have to recast some of your models looking at how both inflation and or interest rates might impact your your decisions and your um, cash flow models based on those uh, unemployment uh, the fca sees unemployment as a as a uh, critical a challenge for 2023 across the financial services. Um, again, um, the Office of Budgetary Responsibility has said that the UK is likely to avoid a recession technically in uh, 2023. However, um, there are considerations and a, a widespread analysis as to where the level of unemployment could end up by the end of 2024, 2025. Um, that could permeate down through into some of your clients, um, some of your businesses in its entirety and some of your markets and carriers. Uh, we may see increasing levels of unemployment linked to uh, the interest rate and inflation, potentially reducing the level of need for, for um, insurance products or creating more pressure on insurance product margins. The household disposable income, key here for the retail sector, for brokers, again, combination of higher interest rates and high inflation pushing up uh, prices for all members of the household, potentially reducing free cash into that disposable income to spend on uh, to spend on the more premium insurance type products. Uh, we've seen in response to this, a number of brokers and carriers have launched more budget friendly um, and uh, sort of value range products to the market. Um, the FCA are keen to understand how these provide value. And it would be interesting to see through the consumer duty lens um, how value assessments are being made, both in terms of these um, 
more more cost effective range products, but also the dis any discernible difference between premium rated insurance products and more value driven insurance products. And, and lastly, as a challenge for 2023, we're seeing market, volatil market volatility. Um, thinking here, the FCA are looking at the in seemingly increasing geopolitical uncertainty across the globe and the impact that that has on extended distribution change, extended value change, and potential impact that that's going to have for the insurance intermediaries in terms of um, clients seeking different and nuanced products covering um, global distribution and supply chains and what kind of products or market disruption um, they require to, to help service their clients. So what have we done and, and, and what does this mean? Well, I, I've, as I said, I've reviewed the the plan and boiled it down into the main areas that I believe are real key impact points uh, for the broking industry in the UK. Firstly, and no surprises here, uh, consumer duty. Um, consumer duty is not only underpins the work the FCA are doing to put consumers first, we've seen material investment by the FCA in departments focused on the impact of consumer duty, both in terms of authorization and ongoing supervision that they're intending to provide through the period. So very, very quickly, I will provide a very brief refresh on the consumer duty. Again, if you haven't read uh, the consumer duty principles that came out um, around about July last year, please do so. If you need any assistance in, in reviewing any of that, uh, please get in touch and I would be happy to have a discussion with you. So very quickly, uh, the consumer duty set out a new consumer principle that firms must act to deliver good outcomes for retail customer, consumers. Um, Cross-cutting rules, act in good faith, avoid foreseeable harm and enable support and support retail customers to pursue their financial objectives. That's all about providing good insight, good admin, good um, support and good information to consumers to be able to make effective and rational decisions. And then the four outcomes specifically enshrined within the consumer duty, uh, thinking about products and services, how do you design, build, distribute and service products and services that meet the needs of your clients and how have you identified who those consumers are. Uh, price and fair value, uh, really factoring in how you're identifying and reporting on measuring and assuming those value measures and metrics across all the products that you're distributing or manufacturing and how you monitoring those in real time or as near to real time as you can. Consumer understanding this boils into your um, how you're communicating, how you're engaging, how you're providing information to consumers throughout the life cycle of that product. So not not necessarily thinking about servicing uh, selling, servicing and claims handling in isolation, but looking at the consumer journey all across that, uh, that, all across that distribution chain. And then lastly, that consumer support. Again, when something goes wrong, how do you support your consumer to understand what went wrong, how you need to, to rectify that and what uh, remediation action may be required to support them? So um, as part of the consumer duty from last year, again, October last year was a big, big date in the diary where it was expected that uh, firms should have agreed implementation plans to and establish processes to maintain oversight over their delivery. Uh, fast forward to a couple of months time, end of July, uh, the clear expectation from the FCA is that firms have done everything they need to do um, to, on existing uh, new products to implement the impact, uh, to implement consumer duty in their operation. Um, insight from the FCA would suggest that uh, they understand that this can be quite a large task for a number of firms. And what they're really looking for is they're looking for documented uh, demonstrable evidence that people are moving in the right direction. If, you're, if you've got too many products and you know you're not going to meet those July deadlines, then making sure that you have um, well categorised, well assessed, well prioritised and well documented rationale for how you've addressed the most vulnerable, the, the, the most risky elements and products that you provide uh, will stand you in better stead than if you've taken a, a much more sort of scattergun approach to, to implementing the duty. And then lastly, uh, coming into next year, uh, July time again, uh, looking to apply the duty to products and services held in closed, closed books. 
So if there was ever any doubt about the importance of the consumer duty, then let's take a look at what the FCA's activity has been since the guidance came out. They've provided six individual speeches that have focused on consumer duty since those rules were finalised. Six individual podcasts on the key attributes of the duty. There's been webinars. They've hosted events. They've provided two further updates, clarifying and codifying expectations on firms, including the appointment of consumer champions at a, at a very senior level in firms and a, a multi-firm survey with uh, some key points, which we'll head into in just a minute. Uh, the consumer duty remains core within the FCA's business plan for 2023. Um, and is going to be embedded within their approach to authorization and supervision through the period. The FCA have gone so far as to dedicate nearly six million pounds of funding in resources to committed to the consumer duty work and building on that work through there uh, through 2023 and 2024. Uh, there are some comments there from those speeches that they provided really focusing down and, and implement, in, indicating that consumer duty remains at the heart of what the FCA are looking to achieve and supporting their delivery of their objectives. In terms of the importance of the consumer duty, they've highlighted through their multi-firm review uh, six key considerations for firms in implementing uh, and making sure consumer duty sticks in the organisation. First and foremost, right in the centre there, we've got culture and people. The FCA have deemed it was so important that the culture and the people within firms understand the nuances and how consumer duty impacts their firms. Without changes to the culture and people, you can change all the processes around it, but you're not going to bed down consumer duty as a consumer-led organisation, a consumer-focused broker. Uh, feeding on from that, setting the right governance tone and the oversight uh, and accountabilities at that senior level, making sure you're getting the right tone from the top, driving that through the business and setting the right outlook and objectives, uh, things like embedding it within the remuneration and incentivization of people within the firm. Uh, the deliverability uh, through their multi-firm review, they identified that some firms had set good plans in place, but there was no effective deliverability or tangible metric as to how they were going to achieve those deliverables or how they were going to opine on whether they'd met them or not. So making sure that you're setting a relevant course of action, following up on it on a timely basis and getting that feed up into that governance and oversight structure to make sure you're all on track to deliver those outcomes. Engagement with third parties, especially in extended distribution lines or where you're utilising third parties, um, appointed representatives and the like to help distribute products to the end user, making sure that there's an ongoing active communication with them. You're aware of what controls and processes they're putting in place and how they're implementing the consumer duty within their culture, their people and governance and oversight structures. Focusing all of this within the four outcomes identified in, that, in the consumer duty as previously discussed and looking at data strategies with organisations to ensure that they're capturing the right metrics in the right timescale that's going to provide insight and um, a narrative on, on how the culture and people have been updated and how consumer duty is being embedded in the business, uh, not really thinking this as a one-off project to embed, but really thinking of it as how to in, in, ingrain it into the very essence of, of the broking um, philosophy and focusing um, consumers at a forefront of the lens that is used. So what are we doing and what are we seeing? Well, uh, we're being asked by a number of clients to make sure that uh, from a culture and people point of view, as I said, um, reviewing incentives, remuneration mechanisms to make sure that um, consumer duty forms part of that incentivization, demonstrating there's a clear lens through which uh, investment decisions, product decisions and even placement decisions are made in the consumer's interest, reviewing the training, development and support provided across firms, across your people, making sure that they understand what's, in, what's expected of them and delivering that to the consumers. 
from a governance and oversight point of view, we're engaging with boards and committees, looking at their effectiveness, how they're embedding consumer outcomes within their own decision making processes. Have they appointed people like consumer champions? What are their roles? How are roles being articulated within the SMCR regime uh, where appropriate? And reviewing and assessing MI reporting and other oversight mechanisms through which they can opine on, on how um, how well products are delivering real value to um, to their consumers. Uh, focusing on that deliverability angle, we're really focused on how um, project plans, those implementation plans that were constructed sort of circa October 2022, how they're being delivered into a live range of risk and control management within the business, uh, what um, they're doing in terms of managing that as a, as a piece of work, not just in its deliverability right now, but also then how's that migrate over into business as usual practice, assurance over second line type reviews and compliance programs. Uh, what are your second line and compliance activities doing, looking at consumer duty? How are you looking at it either in isolation for specific lines of business where you've identified particular vulnerabilities or riskier factors, or if you're taking a much more holistic approach over the claims operation or uh, communication uh, to particular clients and consumers, how you're identifying, mapping and risk assessing those individual consumer, um, those consumer journeys through the processes. Uh, the duty outcomes, again, focusing on those four aspects and providing assurance over the product design, uh, looking at how you design that with the key duty considerations, how it's designed with a real core consumer lens to it, what, um, what value measures you've got uh, surrounding how you're assessing that and your timeliness and effectiveness of assessing those um, tipping points in in potentially some of those products as you as you design them and as they're being sold into the business into the market um, assurance on the consumer customer journeys across distribution channels so again looking at how you um, assessed risk prioritized um, and analyze the individual journeys. Um, are they all using uh, third party apps? Are they using, uh, can, are they using um, price comparison websites? Do you have a direct to market? Are you telephony driven? Are you face to face driven? How have you segmented out your consumer journeys across a di different distribution base, different channels, different markets, different sectors? Um, third parties, providing assurance, going into third parties and providing assurance that their controls are up to, up to scratch, they're in line with your expectations, they're meeting your requirements and your de defined expectations around consumer duty and how you want to, uh, how you want to distribute your products. Uh, reviewing the information received from third parties, which fills into that data side as well, making sure that you're setting, receiving, gaining insight through that relevant, timely, effective, data management coming up um, from third parties and being uh, provided through your internal systems and controls um, collated and reported accurately to the relevant committees and assurance that data and relevance to specific duty outcomes is complete and accurate at all stages. So what happens now? Well, we very much believe that um, this the implementation of the consumer duty as it stands now is likely to reflect the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. It's likely that the FCA are going to be conducting more multi-firm reviews in the future with additional more detailed data requirements on products, consumer outcomes being sought from, from uh, brokers and distributors. The ability or not of firms to demonstrate a consumer focused approach may start impacting regulatory involvement, both in terms of the uh, uh, authorization and ongoing supervision of firms through uh, the FCA's lens and also you'll need to consider the interconnectivity of FCA guidance from last year and the relevance and reference to the current SMCR discussion papers and future um, FCA guidance that's coming towards the end of the year. Moving on from consumer duty we're going to talk very briefly around financial resilience so the FCA have uh, noted uh, a number of um, 
So the FCA have a focus on reducing and preventing serious harm, including financial failure. And they've identified sort of three specific outcomes that they're looking to ensure brokers continue to meet. One is around the financial resources that brokers are able to conduct their business uh, and wind down without fail, um, uh, wind down or fail without significant harm being caused to their consumers. Um, this goes both in lines with the specific financial resilience requirements and extends across your TC 2.4 threshold conditions. Um, what does it mean for you? It really means for brokers developing, maintaining and reflecting changes in your strategies and plans that are linked to these considerations, making sure that you're uh, ring fencing financial uh, resources where appropriate and where possible and that you're demonstrating a, an ongoing ability to reflect and refine your financial resilience requirements. Uh, second outcome they're looking for is making sure that client assets and funds are held appropriately. Um, you can perform effective client by client reconciliations when needed and uh, funds are able to be identified, traced and returned as quickly as possible. Um, key here really is to make sure you maintain and ensure um, an insolvency mindset when you're dealing with these. The key is to try and ring fence these uh, client assets as much as possible and as cleanly as possible. So in the event of any wind down or insolvency, they're not included into the corporate assets, therefore securing and, and preventing any undue harm to, to consumers, clients in the market. Uh, identification and rectification. Uh, the FCA are really looking at firms now to start the process of identifying um, stresses leading to uh, a failure. So think here, the ongoing interest rate risk uh, where interest rate rises may uh, limit your ability to meet or service debt or bank covenants, which may lead to an insolvency or a wind up uh, invested bank. Um, confidence, covenants, return on investment rates, hurdle rates, uh, lots of things in here that may purely as a financial impact may be needed to be identified and you may need to start taking activity to rectify these uh, as quickly as possible. And the FCA is looking for uh, documentation that um, firms are considering these and are baking them into their processes. Um, activities, what are they undertaking? Firstly, a uh, new regulatory return uh, going to be capturing roughly 20,000 solo regulated firms, asking them to provide a new uh, baseline of financial information relative to financial resilience. Um, this is going to be part of the REMAR process that the FCA has embedded for a good number of years now, but introduces, as I say, another, another requirement on them. Um, the FCA are going to use this information along with other sets of tools and data led dashboards to identify emerging issues uh, and for them to act. Uh, they're going to be assessing financial winds down or forecasts ahead of authorization and potentially ahead of merger acquisitions, changing controls um, and other regulatory or supervisory activities. If you've got businesses thinking of moving from appointed representatives to broker, uh, authorization is likely to form part of their requirements to have a look at um, and, and opine on how, how, well, um, how well you're meeting their conditions. And then lastly, it's going to be part of that monitoring activity with higher, with higher risk businesses being asked to be, um, uh, being asked to be monitored on a more regular basis in the first year. Um, or during periods of high growth. Uh, what can we expect? Um, increased requirements for data and engaging engagement with existing firms to assess and demonstrate appropriate financial resilience and or wind down plans. Uh, the SEA is striving to be more data driven, more targeted supervision through the regulatory returns, greater intervention of firms to demonstrate effective resilience and or wind down planning and those increased authorization requirements and potentially supervision in the initial years. Um, that concludes my area of the presentation. I want to hand over to Michael, who's going to talk through cyber resilience. And um, uh, great. great, thank you, Richard. Really appreciate that going through and following up on the FCA's plan and the area that I'll be covering today, operational resilience. 
Um, you know, when we go through the category here, you can see the plan objectives, not too much different from topics Richard has gone through. Probably what I point on this is a couple key items. The third bullet from the bottom that says the data-led detection and the last one there where the FCA is pledged to be able to identify firms that are more susceptible to receiving proceeds from fraud and protecting against financial crimes. Richard had mentioned, you know, a near $6 million investment that the FCA is putting forward to help reduce serious harm. Where they put some of those investments is building up their own technology, their own capabilities to be more in line with the modern standards to detect what's going on out there from a compliance perspective and a controls oversight. Um, the operational resilience, this shouldn't be too um, unfamiliar with firms as to the definition of resilience, but we wanna remind people that it is not breaking something, but pushing it to the point where something may break and making sure that it doesn't. So what the FCA as part of their plan is gonna to look to um, and what they've evaluated is seeing a continuing level of risk growing in the cyber threat landscape, the global tensions that are happening around the globe, uh, nation state actors that are extremely well equipped with tremendous resources that can cause serious, serious harm and disruption on financial markets. What they're also gonna look at for this year is making it clearer how firms should report incidents should they arise and developing new rules to address the systematic risks that critical third parties bring from an operational resilience perspective. Firms must remember that you know your resilience and all those with your third parties, I'll call it more the supply chain because it will lead to your fourth parties, fifth parties, but anybody in that procurement parse in that procurement chain of services to provide to your customer that could be disrupted needs to be evaluated. So how is the FCA going to achieve this? Well, they're going to assess how operationally resilient firms are and remaining with their impact tolerances. And they want to make it clearer to firms how they should report operational incidents, including what, when, and how they were reported. And they'll leverage this information to help disseminate intelligence to the community so that they can better prevent against other attacks that may come up against uh, similar peer firms. They're also going to make a focus on the critical third parties and we'll be publishing a consultation paper and oversight giving new standards, testing approach, and guidance for oversight over those critical third parties. When we look at the operational resilience requirements, these shouldn't be new to anybody. They've been out there for a while. As Richard mentioned, there's journeys and hurdles. Uh, the initial requirements have firms must map their important business processes, people, technology. Impact tolerance is probably the most element to be um, identified, as well as the metrics that you're going to use to measure against those. And I'll talk a little bit about metrics on a slide coming up. The resilience requirements, again, in addition to those mentioned before, is conducting lessons learned. So how can we do exercises to test our resilience? We don't know where that point of breakage may be unless we're running through scenarios, plausible scenarios. And when we talk about the cybersecurity threat landscape, uh, the plausible scenarios continue to evolve. And there is a lot more that firms need to be aware of. Uh, they continue to change every day. So it's a moving target. Firms need to continue to self-assess their environments their documentations need to be updated around how they're governing their controls and protecting against the cyber attacks. When it comes to the impact tolerances though, the FCA does still believe firms are best set their own impact tolerance levels. They understand their business, they understand their commitments to their clients, but they have to always make sure that there's not intolerable harm handed down to the clients. And they also have responsibilities against overall market integrity. So they have to look at the boundaries outside of their walls and their clients and how it may be a more widespread disruption and what harms they could have on others if they should be impacted. So they're expected to manage this business, uh, business risk and focus on the preventive measures. When it does come to measuring the impact tolerances, time duration will always be the mandatory metric. And then that'll vary based on the clients you're serving. Vulnerable needs may have different timeframes and responses that are required, but it's basically gonna be a service by service, firm by firm approach. But then there's additional metrics that need to be added in based on that service, based on the client demands, based on the requirements that'll tie in the cost, the scale, 
the type of transactions and the number of people. And of course, materiality is always going to come into play. All of these metrics need to have their specific tolerance levels, but then need to be evaluated in coordination with each other. And so that one isn't pushing the other over the brink of that tolerance level. We'll talk now a little bit about the incident response, the readiness, the planning and testing. As we mentioned before, that's one of the things the FCA will evaluate. And if you're not testing your response to incidents, these plausible scenarios, how do you know if you're gonna hit your tolerance levels? And doing this testing is something that the FCA will review. They'll wanna see that you're going through your plans, that you're identifying where you have weaknesses and that you're looking for areas where you can make improvements. So developing scenarios that can test a wide range of elements in your program and that would be most likely targeted by attackers and obviously have the most impactful disruption if they were knocked offline or no longer producing the services that we put out to our clients. Your incident response planning and testing should be a standard part of every cyber and information security program. And I would imagine everybody listening today has that within their organization, but no incident response plan is ever complete because the attack threat landscape continues to evolve. For every new piece of technology that comes into the marketplace, for every new vendor we add into our environment, for every new partner we do work with, for every new adoption, whether it's an artificial intelligence adoption or another API that we're putting into our environment, these will continually evolve how we need to respond to these incidents. So your incident response plan should start primarily with a risk identification, a risk-based approach. Let's focus on our most critical assets. We can't test everything in the environment on the cadence that we'd like to. And so we need to prioritize our efforts and make sure we're looking at the most impactful areas. Make sure our governance around our policies and procedures are not only current, but are routinely tested. And as I said, as the threat landscape evolves, we need to make sure they're updated. The scenario identification, these are these plausible scenarios. They need to cover the modern technologies. Uh, traditional resiliency plans was hurricane, fire, flood, pandemic now has entered in there. But in the cyberspace, we look at those technology attacks. Uh, ransomware, definitely still one of the leading ones that's knocking firms offline and causing a severe disruption in their services but also data breach. Uh, exposed data can cause harm to the consumers, insider threats, and any compromise across that supply chain that we mentioned. All of these should be involved in different scenarios and thought through in what we call a tabletop exercise, which is basically a gathering of an audience within the organization, sometimes, actually not sometimes, but often including those third parties. It may be different audiences. We may break them out into sections with our IT group, um, certain lines of business on their specifics, but ultimately you have to make sure you're doing one at the senior level with the executives, making sure that they're gonna understand what questions may be asked of them during an incident. Time is of the essence, there's reporting requirements, and often these attackers are making demands that may require some timely responses, or do you even respond? So understanding who you need to get involved, when we may need to tap in legal counsel, when we may need to get a third party involved, all have to be understood. So when you do these exercises, it's important to capture lessons learned. And once again, it's an exercise. Nobody's gonna be perfect, but you're gonna identify areas where you need to improve and then make those remediation efforts. As Richard mentioned, I'm sorry, it was Paul that mentioned at the beginning, we just wanted to give it a little overview. The FCA did provide some sampling of 47 insurance companies that they reviewed their resiliency operations just about a year ago. And they focused on three core areas, which was the reasonableness, reasonableness of important business services and the impact tolerances that these firms selected, their consideration of consumer harm differentiated by product type or distribution channel, and the consideration of consumer harm according to the consumer type or vulnerability. Going across these areas, they fortunately did find some of the firms have done what the FCA has asked. They've prop appropriately identified their important business services, provided considerable examples of the types of harm. These slides will be provided. I'm not gonna necessarily need to read them for you all, but you can see they've done some of the areas that the FCA has looked at. Unfortunately, however, the list of five that they found in good categories 
more than doubles when they look to areas where firms are deficient in hitting what they expect, not demonstrating an understanding of the FCA and the PRA guidelines, not identifying important business processes, not considering consumer harm, applying unsuitable answers to services, not doing meaningful consideration of the impact of unavailable important business services. Coming here, there's a second slide, even more areas that they saw they weren't doing well. Not appropriately identifying high levels of consumer harm, areas where they're providing generic answers or using templates to generate their materials. These must be custom for your organization. It's not a check the box exercise. These are serious events that can cause significant damage to the customers and that's the mission of the FCA. So you really have to go through these scenarios, vet them well, make sure you're understanding the tolerances and well before the point of breakage that your firm is gonna hit. The critical third parties, as I mentioned in the business plan, it is an area where the FCA does plan to publish a paper later this year, giving more guidance on how firms should be reviewing their third parties, the type of risk evaluation that they expect, and most importantly, the testing. So the controls that our third parties are one step removed from our oversight, thus they're higher risk. How can we appropriately test those? Um, the FCA will be given the guidance. Do we rely on third party attestation reports? Do we need to go in and do more specifics? What type of information are we gonna need to require from these third parties and how frequently do we need to follow up? These are all things we'll expect will be in the paper that will give more guidance and continue to look at really not from third party, but I expect it's going to go more into a supply chain view, which is your third party's third party, your fourth party, and so on and so forth down that chain of services to your clients. And the last area I just want to touch base on is where the FCA is continually looking to reduce and prevent financial crimes, uh, the scams that continue to arise and the threats evolve every day. The attackers are more equipped than ever. They are more empowered. They're more sophisticated. The vectors we're putting into our environments continue to give them more opportunities to attack our firms. And I always continue to tell people these attack groups are criminal organizations. They're run like professional firms. However, they don't have these regulations to deal with. They don't have to worry about customer care or taxes or employee benefits. So it's a tough challenge that firms are up against. So to help combat those, really need to make sure that there is a strong security culture, same like Richard mentioned on the financial resilience and other areas around customer duty and care. It's that culture, but for security, it really needs to focus at the top. I know we all think our is the most important, but cyber risk is in the top three of all business risks across the globe these days. And that tone from the top is extremely important. Solid governments from top to bottom, making sure people understand what they need to do and our policies and procedures are routinely updated and tested. And then of course, the threat awareness. Leaders need to know what the risk is. What is the potential harm? This information flows through the organization often provided through third parties and the different audiences that are receiving the threat information have to make sure it's put into context that relates to their role and their decisions that they're making. Example, an IT's threat intelligence view and what they need to decipher on a daily basis will be different than the CEO or your CFO. Similar, but they'll have different decisions that they'll have to make and different priorities and understanding what information they're getting and knowing that they understand what decisions are gonna be expected of them based on that information is very critical. Then coming into the last area that I mentioned before, the technology adoption, Firms are continually to bring in um, new applications, new third parties we connect to, artificial intelligence, the big buzz now that many firms will most likely be deploying down the road. All of these need to have um, risk assessments that performed across them and in integrated into those scenario plans. How will this new technology affect our resiliency and our tolerance? Is it gonna cause an impact? Where might be the delay? What are all the third parties that are tied into this? new technology that we're bringing into environment. So all of these need to be brought together and addressing operational resilience ties into cyber resilience and ties into operational risk. It's a combined effort across these groups in the firm where leadership is setting the bar on where we need to focus our efforts on risk. We don't have unlimited resources, so we need to prioritize. 
your operations team across the board will make sure that the customers are served. That's your front facing, your front office. And the cyber team, as I mentioned, they're kind of working on the moving target, making sure that our resilience is being continually monitored and tested against the evolving threat landscape, the challenges that arise every day and morph into more attacks and opportunities for the bad guys. The FCA has committed $6 million to help combat these attacks and these crimes. Um, they're gonna expect firms will follow suit and put their efforts forward to get to the same result. I believe that comes to the end of my slide. Um, for this part on the closing, I'll pass to my colleague, Richard, and maybe just give some closing comments. Richard, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, so that's taken us through the FCA business plan for 2023-24, the consumer duty update with its imminent implementation at the end of July this year, the financial resilience with the increased regulatory focus to regulatory return coming again during this year, and a very thoughtful update from uh, Michael there on cyber security and operational resilience. Uh, that concludes our presentation today, but we'd like to thank you for joining us. If you have any specific questions that you'd like to discuss with us, please find our contact details on the PKF website. Always happy to have a talk through anything to do with the FCA business plan or the broker market in general purposes. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to presenting to you again in the near future. Goodbye.